it would be only a John DeLorean that could say, not since Walter Chrysler has anyone as well prepared sought to enter the auto industry. He was the guy who brought a dream. And we all lived that dream. We all felt part of that dream. It was our dream. I felt that I would help myself, I would help my company, and I would help that bunch of people. And for a while, it turned out that way. It wasn't like another Ford Escort been built. This was something different. Having led us up to Garden Pass, he suddenly went to a stage where he hadn't got any money at all. And one just knew then that he was not a man to rely on. This is the tale of the biggest car crash in automotive history. The story of how a modern day Machiavelli spent 85 million pounds of taxpayers' money in pursuit of his dream of building a stainless steel sports car. Nearly a quarter of a century ago, the only sports car ever built in Ireland ceased production. The car was as controversial as it was non-conventional. Gullwing doors, stainless steel skins, and a cost to the taxpayer of around £275 million in today's money. It was the DeLorean DMC-12. It was the first time I've driven a DeLorean. I've obviously heard lots about them over the years, especially when the factory started up here. There was a lot of excitement in Northern Ireland about building a sports car. I think the look of the car is fantastic. It still looks very striking today. Designed as a sports car for the masses, its future-proofed film star looks fast-tracked it on the road to stardom. I mean, look at that. There's, there's really been nothing since that has looks as futuristic and uh, uh, as worthy of space travel as, as this. I'm going to take a little joy ride. With extraordinary vision, DeLorean saw riots strewn West Belfast not as a hindrance, but as a glorious opportunity. He was going to build a car in a state-of-the-art factory, make a lot of money, and have his name mentioned in the same breath as Enzo Ferrari and Ferdinand Porsche. He almost succeeded. If this had been a Ferrari instead of a Ferrari badge on it, it would have sold. The story begins 3,000 miles away in another industrial city, Detroit, car capital of America and home of some of the biggest gas guzzlers on the planet. John Zachary DeLorean was its rising star. I was a pretty talented engineer. I still am. Today, I don't think there's a car running anywhere in the world that doesn't have something that I created on it, even now. I was the youngest vice president General Motors ever had. I was the youngest group executive they ever had, the youngest head of Pontiac, the youngest chief engineer, the youngest head of Chevrolet. He was the youngest general manager by far, and I don't think anybody had ever achieved that at that age. He almost quadrupled Pontiac sales during his time with the division, which was a phenomenal achievement. The man had a vision and could see the vision through. I mean, he took a, a failing division and turned it into the, the, the top division within GM within a very short time. The dealers, you know, saw him as their messiah. He could do no wrong as far as they were concerned. You get to a certain point and all of a sudden, particularly in large corporations, you're living a lifestyle you can't believe. You a fleet of private planes at your disposal. Everywhere you go, there's a, uh, cars to meet you at the airport. They take your luggage to the hotel and check it in, and you, you know, basically do nothing. It was a pretty incredible life. He was outspoken. He was a little bit off-center. He was dating uh, starlets and so on, which is not the normal procedure at General Motors at all. That's the level where you're supposed to sort of sit back and, you know, uh, coast to your retirement. By 1973, he was tipped for the top job at General Motors, but he wasn't the type to be constrained by corporate politics. It was time to go it alone. Instead of GMC on the boot, John wanted the badge to read DMC. I think it sort of came to me one time when I was making the new car announcement. 
and we're telling the dealers and the public what a dramatic and miraculous new car this was. And it really wasn't. It was the same old car with the fenders bent a little bit differently. And uh, so I thought, I just can't keep doing this. And so I decided to go off and try to do something more ethical from the standpoint of uh, something that would last. And that's where the uh, stainless steel car concept came from. DeLorean left General Motors with little more than a few ideas sketched out on the back of an envelope. Needing someone to give his vision life, he approached the man considered to be the most innovative car designer in the world, the Italian Giorgetto Giugiario. DeLorean's unique concept was to produce a rust-proof, eco-friendly sports car with safety of paramount importance. The designs were stunning. It was christened the DMC-12 and would retail at just $12,000. But building this car wasn't going to come cheap. DeLorean had little or no money himself. He had to find backers, fast. With only a concept car to sell, the Silver Fox approached his old friends, the car dealers, to help him raise capital for the project. They didn't let him down and soon he had the first eight million in the bank. But this was small change for what was really needed. Never one to miss an opportunity, John figured that rather than go to the traditional car makers, he would exploit countries with high unemployment. The Industrial Development Authority, the IDA, came along to me and they said some of their people in America were talking to a man called DeLorean, uh, who had uh, a project uh, for a revolutionary new type of car. When the IDA gave a sort of indicative offer, he came back a few days later and said that he had a higher one from Puerto Rico. <laughs> the IDA got suspicious about that, and I must say I was suspicious about it too. Uh, but that was his method of operating. As a manager of a public company, I have an obligation to see where I can make the best arrangement for my shareholders. He would talk, say to one, well, I'm getting a better deal from another one. He thought that uh, I wouldn't resist uh, whatever he looked for. He and his, uh, and his uh, people would uh, endeavor to you know, get the best deal they could by some uh, doing and froing between different candidates. I felt we shouldn't go on with it. It's believed the idea pulled out of a possible deal because they considered the project too risky. The spin that he put on the whole thing after we had said no to him uh, didn't impress me either. I didn't feel I should spend my investors' money in a capricious and arbitrary way. He seems to have a plausible sort of answer for everything. And I'm suspicious of someone who has a plausible answer for every difficulty because some difficulties are huge and they can't be overcome that easily. With the Irish out of the way, the Puerto Ricans thought they had the deal sewn up, but they hadn't reckoned on DeLorean's blatant opportunity. He had heard of a place even more in need of a good news story and a government ready to invest. He took a call from Belfast. Ten years of conflict had left almost 2,000 people dead and the highest unemployment in Western Europe made Northern Ireland an investment-free zone. The Labour government was desperate to get men off the dole and away from the paramilitaries. Roy Mason had this mantra, which was jobs, homes and hope, and he perceived that as the only real alternative to a military solution to, to deal with the IRA. I think the people in Belfast were quite proactive about it, and I think they, they made the first move, if I'm not mistaken, and said, hey, if this is going, we want to have a look at it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sensing a better deal, DeLorean left the Puerto Ricans in mid-negotiation and boarded a plane bound for Belfast. John made his pitch, and the government took the bid. The this is a car assembly plant. If the United States market is going for it. The company have got 400 outlets already. They've got private investment behind them. They've got 30,000 orders already for the car. Back in New York, the Puerto Ricans thought all they had to do was sign on the dotted line. They had no idea there was another player at the table. Did you get the impression at the time that you were negotiating it that you were involved in a race? Uh, I was involved with competition, yes, but uh, not a race. Were you playing one off against the other? 
I think that's making it sound a lot cruder than it was. The British and the Northern Irish Development Agency secretly did the deal in just 46 days. The Puerto Ricans were still stuck in their New York hotel. After these great inducements they offered us, that that was probably a more logical place for us to go. It made, I think, probably headlines in every national and provincial newspaper. And it was perceived as a significant coup for the government. Their feeling in the North was slightly triumphalist, in some quarters anyway. Uh, they thought that they had sort of uh, got one over on Dublin, as it were. The Irish Industrial Development Authority considered it too risky an investment for them to take. Well, they said that when they'd lost it. To be perfectly honest, if I'd have lost it, I would have been probably saying the self same thing. Is it true that uh, the Secretary of State, Mr Mason, told the head of the Department of Commerce that he was to give DeLorean, quotes, everything he wants? No, I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, I never saw that and I was never involved with discussions at all like that. Certainly, we went all out to get it. The Labour government was ecstatic. They offered £53 million of taxpayers' money in grants, low-interest loans and a greenfield site on which to build a space-age factory. DeLorean's only guarantee was to build the car. They accomplished so much so quickly. Uh, all the little obstacles that we've had other places were just taken care of immediately. Oh, I'm quite delighted. I think when I talk about the tide turning on industrial investment, I think this is uh, one that proves it is. I was glad that it was uh, somebody else's money that was at risk other than the Irish taxpayers' money. It didn't take long for the word to spread that a sports car was to be built in Belfast. It's here on this greenfield site near Twinbrook Estate in troubled West Belfast that the biggest industrial gamble this province has ever seen is to take place. You've got to be in Dunmurry. That's the only place that this deal applies because it was in this... Uh, basically, there was a Catholic estate on one side and a Protestant community on the other side. And the idea of a sports car factory slap bang in the middle of West Belfast was a seriously risky venture. Nonetheless, it captured the imagination and there were no shortage of applicants. I was watching television and there was this tall, bronzed American on, very charismatic, and he was speaking about all things, about starting a sports car factory in Belfast. I mean, that was just incredible. This is an area of extremely high unemployment. One man in three is without work. People couldn't believe it, that, that there was a factory coming in and setting up in that area. It's also an area which has seen more than its fair share of the troubles, and it has none of the engineering tradition of other parts of Northern Ireland. This was the start of something big. That'd be a wee bit of an ego thing, but I just wanted to be part of the Dorian setup. There were stories which abounded at that stage of letters which were written to John DeLorean, care of DeLorean Detroit, from, from people who said, I, I want a job. There's complete euphoria about this factory and nearly every household there's an application form. Right away, I got my CV down and said, I want to work here. This is really exciting. I would love to work for DeLorean. I've been out of work now for just over a year. Since uh, we heard this factory was coming, um, the people have got a kind of a hope, you know. It's a hope that um, if they're lucky that they'll get a job in the plant. It seems incredible these guys have come over here to give us, give us a chance, you know. But how can they ever build a sports car in West Belfast? Well, I think what it did to a significant extent was, was to vindicate Mason's mantra of, you know, jobs, homes and hope. And here were, here, here were jobs. In, in something that was tangible, that had something of an international reputation, uh, and it, it was hope. The pieces were falling into place. DeLorean now had the land, he'd secured the millions, and the people were ready to build the car. The only thing missing was technical expertise to turn his prototype into the real thing. He turned to Colin Chapman and his Lotus Car Company. Lotus was a prestige mark, but the company was short of cash and Chapman had no experience of mass-producing cars. The appearance of DeLorean on the scene was manna from heaven for Colin Chapman. Here was the customer to beat all customers. We were going through a fairly difficult period with car manufacturing. It was not the best time. Uh, and he was just attracted to the, the prospect of the money that the programme would generate. 
John was a user, and he saw Chapman as somebody he could use to, to get his car built. Uh, simple as that. Promising to get the car into the showroom in just 18 months, he headhunted the top three engineers in the business. But in true DeLorean style, he told each they had sole responsibility for the car. I joined DeLorean on the basis that there were prototype cars in existence. And I had driven one in California, in fact. And I thought it was a question of developing an existing prototype car into a production unit, which I thought was just about on in 18 months. But having joined and really got into it, I found that not only was I not the only chief engineer, I was one of three, um, and that the old car was being redesigned totally in the image of Lotus. It was almost a Lotus Esprit with a stainless steel shell. I think Mike felt that he, he should have had a great deal more input uh, and responsibility. They weren't what I would call a mass production company. They weren't geared up for that. So I had to say at the time that I didn't think a lot of the design suited mass production. In reality, we were told to evaluate the prototype that they brought with them, but in all other respects to just simply ignore them, which was, uh, was quite difficult. But uh, that, that was the agreement that DeLorean and Chapman had obviously had. Putting the design and production teams on opposite sides of the Irish Sea started to cause problems. Things were beginning to slip. The only thing that I didn't like too much was the, the uh, intrusion into the door opening. Well, it didn't seem, it wasn't polished and professional. We really have to look at how we do that. If you used to go for one day a week on a regular basis, but when I was there for the week or more, there was a tendency for Lotuses to be wheeled out and DeLoreans to be wheeled in. I mean, surely it was part of the master programme anyway. I know Mike employed people to, to come over and sit with us uh, over at Lotus to, to try and dem demonstrate that we, we weren't perhaps doing things in the way that he wanted them done, but uh, nothing ever came of it. The latest sketch was the one we've got now. Well, my, guys, my guys can't even get them. It caused a few exciting episodes in board meetings and so on, but... Uh, Usually Mike rushing in and out. I think there was something captured on film at some time. We got the idea, or the impression, if you like, that we were not exactly interlopers, but we were getting in their way. Yet we had this overwhelming urgency, if you like, and desire that it should be right by the time it moved over to Dunmurray. With time running out, DeLorean had to compromise on his original vision. Instead of a $12,000 safety car, he now had a modified Lotus Esprit costing twice the price. To speed up production, parts were brought in from other manufacturers. Some of the interior came from Volkswagen, the brakes were from a Ford Cortina, the chassis from GKN, but perhaps most controversial of all was the engine. A V6 PRV from Peugeot, Renault and Volvo, rear-mounted, liquid-cooled, 2.85-litre, single overhead camshaft. But, because of the car's weight, 0 to 60 took a leisurely 10 seconds. To put that engine in the back was madness. Um, it looks awful, it sounds awful, and it's got no power, so... <laughs> you know, you couldn't have picked a worse engine. And that's nice, the way that comes up. And then, voila! Look at that. You know, there's nothing. Thereby I rest my case, my lord. You know, it's such a shame. But you know, at the heart of a sports car, there has to be an engine. On the 2nd of October 1978, work began in transforming a muddy bog in West Belfast into a future-proof car plant. The deal gave DeLorean a government subsidy for every person he employed. A disused carpet factory was used to recruit and train a raw, inexperienced workforce. John was taking a calculated risk. All the workforce were all local and knew nothing about producing cars. There was a lot of scepticism. People kept on referring back to, well, sure, the last time the Northern Irish did a big job was the Titanic, and look what happened to that. We have never built a car before, and a hell of a lot of the management haven't built a car before. So therefore, it is a learning process for everyone. I think my number was, past number was 55, I think it was at that time. So I was the 55th employee at that stage. 
the very first day that I started in the place, these huge, like, prehistoric monsters, the big earth-moving machines, they were trundling up and down, levelling the land. When we built that body shop, which was a 177,000 square feet factory, and as the roof was going on, we were designing the production equipment, the layout, and as the roof went on a section, we did the floor with the layout for the conveyors. And this is a completely new process. No one has ever done this before. I can remember during the building phase looking at the size of the buildings and saying, can you ever see this place filled with cars? And quite frankly, it really, I, I couldn't see it, but I said, someday it will be. In a way, it was nearly like sort of picking some space-age edifice and just planting it down in the middle of Belfast. And there it was, like a giant flying saucer landing on the place. The whole thing of not only a car plant coming into what was on the periphery of West Belfast, but also something that was totally new, something that was a new technology, something that was a new shape, something that was innovative. It wasn't like another Ford Escort and built. This was something different. The whole thing was at a most furious rate. Even Ford, at that time, when they were asked how long it would take to develop a new car, they mentioned a figure of five years. This, to my mind, was one of the most exciting things of the, of the whole project, was the speed that it all happened. May 1979 brought a new government, and with it new challenges for John DeLorean. Margaret Thatcher didn't believe in government subsidies for industry. It may have been all smiles as John greeted successive ministers, but the Tories were sceptical of John, and he took a dim view of them. The Thatcher government was not in favour of subsidising manufacturing industry, and would look askance at any more money that had to be put in. And yet what were we to do? To have cancelled the thing uh, without good reason would have been devastating, and we couldn't have done it. So we just had to go along with it. To be honest with you, when I first heard about the project, I had my doubts myself. However, here it is, established in Belfast, providing employment now for a 1,000 people, which was going to rise to about twice that figure, a great deal of taxpayers' money behind the car, and therefore all of us are hoping it is a success. We're not putting any more money into it, and we certainly hope to recoup our investment, and from what Mr DeLorean says, we shall do so. I think everybody believed in what he was doing. I don't think anybody would have been there unless they did believe. I don't think there was anything to do with the car. I think it was a belief in him. He had this uh, great personality that would, that would persuade people that they could work miracles for him. I mean, I didn't see him very often, but he just looked like a, like a film star. He had this charisma. He could have done anything. Quite a good-looking man, you know. He looked a different class to the rest of us, you know, the tan skin. Grey hair. So tall. He had that aura of glamour. Thin. Certainly photogenic. He looked the part. This was this great man that I'd read about, and there he was in front of him. And his wife was certainly photogenic. Big, tall, leggy woman. And when she came round the factory, it's just damn toes. She was one of the top models in the world. Don't use that saying, she was a spectacular looking, looking woman. Both had huge charisma. At that time, when the company was on the up, and it was quite easy to tell us how wonderful it was. And the other thing, it was quite easy for us to believe how wonderful it was. Things were going well. The DeLorean spent £350,000 on luxury homes in Belfast for themselves and their associates. But Christina DeLorean's first and only visit was interrupted by hunger strike protesters, and she never came back. The story was that he was frightened to live here in case he was captured by the IRA. I can tell you quite clearly that there was no threats. We get threats all the time. Uh, we have sniper shots that have been fired at DMC executives. It would not be in the interest of either the nationalist community, the Catholic community, or the IRA to, uh, to harm John DeLorean. We've had fire bombings, 140 fire bombings since the plant has been built. I think myself that um, 
perhaps uh, Delorean maybe wanted to use it as a bit of an excuse. Certainly they've uh, created an element of instability. Uh, naturally all the people are nervous and we've had a fairly high absenteeism and a, a pretty substantial loss of efficiency during this period of time. I think we had one bullet through the water tower but that could have been fun rather than anything else. Mm, it was a little tricky when we came back on the night Bobby Sands died to find my office had been burnt down amongst other things. As Harold Macmillan might comment a little local difficulty. I think it was quickly realised that if we allowed the troubles outside to come onto the, the shop floor, then there was a danger that the whole, whole thing could collapse down around us. The only politics we have is the fact that everybody prior to it, the vast majority of people are all employed. We had been told there's not going to be any bunting, there's not going to be any union flags, there's not going to be any pictures of the Pope, there's going to be no pictures of the... We're going to keep all that out. That's politics. Leave that outside the factory. When we're in here, you can put pictures of a car up. That's what we're here to do, build cars. Everybody's working for one cause, one cause only. And probably most people's causes to be was that it was given a half-decent wage. And it, a better living than what they had before. The hunger strikers were dying. We could see people on the television at these funerals. People who were working in the factory. And as well as that, there were orange men and loyalists working, all in the same squad. And these people sat together and got on well together. It was a big effort not to allow religious or political sympathies to get in the way of doing a good job. And uh, I have no fault to find that at all. In fact, it was one of the things which was encouraging at a pretty grim time. Have you had cause to regret your choice of Northern Ireland as a manufacturing base? No, uh, we're, we're, we're absolutely sold on the people. You have a very highly motivated workforce who are dedicated, who are skillful, and who are interested. And uh, all things being equal, I can't think of a better place in the world for us to build the kind of car we want to build. Finally, in January 1981, the first DeLorean inched its way down the assembly line. John was proving his critics wrong. This was the first time that anybody had really seen a car. And here it was growing in front of us. So we, we saw the panels going on and the front fenders, I suppose I should say, it was an American car, the front bumpers and back bumpers, and then the doors being fitted on. The car was growing just in front of you. And it really was exciting because a lot of other people from other departments, they would come around, they wanted to see this car and see a DeLorean actually growing in front of them. Nobody knew if it was ever going to start or not, but the time we actually put the key in, I says, maybe turn over for a wee bit, you know, and then it'll start. As soon as I turned the key, bang, away it went. There was a cheer went up, you know. That was the first car that was built in Northern Ireland and was driven around the test track. And uh, I had the pleasure of taking the first time around the test track. I thought it was Jack a lot, really did. Everybody stand watching it. It was a big coup for us because, like, there was literally nothing there, you know, and all of a sudden you had this. The next thing to a miracle, something that we had created that actually worked. And a guy got, drove it out the door, and that was a car which was completely unique. I think probably the, the memorable day for a lot of people was the day the first transporters left. That, I think, for a lot of people, particularly the workforce, it gave them the impression, hey, this is going to work. It was 379 cars left the factory in the first shipment. And everybody watched them leave the factory. They were transported down to the docks facility. They were driven onto the boat. And it's fair to say that most of the employees in the factory turned up that day to see the cars disappear. That was the first batch of cars that left the factory. And that was a, that was a day that none of, us, none of us could actually see that ever happening. But it did happen. It was an immense occasion to see these cars trundling down onto the dock and driving up into that cavernous ship. Amazing, yes, tremendous feeling. On Easter Sunday, 1981, the first shipment of cars left the factory bound for America, and DeLorean secured another 17 million pound loan from the government.
the DeLorean is one of the most awaited automobiles in automotive history. Drive the DeLorean. Live the dream today. The first shipment of 379 DeLoreans is already here. Not so much launched as landed on the American market. The port of entry was Long Beach, the best sales prospects are in California, and here too, in a suburb of Los Angeles, is the car's first service center. There, the DeLoreans are lining up for their customers. The 10 or 12,000 buyers already known to be interested in a $25,000 car. When the cars first came over, a lot of them were charging well over list price for the cars. The, the, the car was a classic, you know, we need, we need it and we want it, and so we're, gonna, we're going to charge the punters uh, over the odds for these cars. That's, that's how much in demand they were when they first hit the market in America. The number of people we could attract who said, can I leave a deposit for the car? And we said, no, we're not taking any more deposits. It got to such a point that I said, the only way we'll take a deposit is 5,000 cash and don't bug me. The customers were lining up in their droves, unaware of the problems that awaited them. The first 400 cars were totally rebuilt by Dick Brown in the States. Stripped down, rebuilt. I forget how many hours it was per car. 400 hours, something like that, 500 hours. An enormous amount, bearing in mind that the production time was supposed to be 50 hours. The first cars, they're dogs, really were dogs. They were through the gap, but in an inexperienced production line. Rough. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of retrofitting, yeah. To be quite honest with you, there was a few people out. I mean, managers and directors were sort of way home that the first load of cars going onto the boat, that the boat sunk. <laughs> so they could maybe claim the compensation and didn't have to sell the cars as such. I certainly wouldn't have bought one, well, you know. And I loved them, you know. I was just getting everything to fit. That was the biggest problem, you know. You were putting a skin on. There mightn't have been anywhere. There mightn't have been a boat, a hole for the boat to go into. But that was all part of the design of it, you know. The fun of it. it was like a Meccano set. Bits didn't fit, we made them fit. All the cars we built, no two were identical. Each panel that you would have put on had to be slightly altered. We had boys that worked on the production line that, that did that, you know. It just didn't fall into place. And that was probably the biggest problem we had. They had to get to the market fast to earn money. We had a lot of, a lot of problems, particularly with doors. Doors were a major problem. They were rough. But then again, they were directly from Lotus Design, I so. Even in the big industries, I mean, they, they run pilot production lines alongside introducing new models and to sort all the problems out before they get switched onto the main line. So, I mean, it's not, certainly not unique to have, to have problems. And we all know problems are still resident in, in vehicles even when they go into mass production. I always thought, and I think it was common belief, that the car was not sufficiently well developed to go into mass production. Uh, it needed to be right. The Lotus factory was over on the east coast of England. Somebody put a large sign up, the further to the east you go, the more you realise that's not where the wise men came from. Despite the ongoing production gremlins, more and more cars were being shipped to the States. It seemed DeLorean's grand plan was coming to fruition. Suddenly, without warning, the DMC empire was rocked by allegations from an insider. A trusted aide, Marion Gibson, delivered a financial bombshell, alleging that DeLorean had misused taxpayers' money to fund a lavish lifestyle and had not put up the amount of personal cash that he had claimed. She brought his personal files across the Atlantic and gave them to one of DeLorean's most vociferous critics, MP Nicholas Winterton. She is a British subject working for an American company, gravely concerned about what might be the uh, impact of the actions of the DeLorean enterprises uh, upon Britain and particularly upon Ulster and the people of that troubled province at this time. Every cent we spend is a subject of an audit. There's nothing. I've never locked uh, my door. I've never locked a drawer. I've never locked a file. We have nothing to hide. I was aware of her claims and I was aware of Winterton's, uh, uh, Winston's interest in it, which was... Um, quite important, but at the time, uh, we did our best to discount it. But uh, I think he had a legitimate point. I feel that deep down Margaret uh, Thatcher uh, was not at all comfortable, was, I would suggest, well aware that all was not uh, well, uh, but didn't want to 
uh, get involved. Margaret Thatcher was forced to get involved. She called a police inquiry, but the furore ended as quickly as it had begun. Only eight days after the investigation was announced, DeLorean was cleared of all impropriety. Do I think I was right uh, to draw the concerns uh, to the uh, attention of government? I do believe to this day that I was entirely justified. Cleared of financial wrongdoing, the way was now open for DeLorean to up the ante. He proposed floating the company on the stock exchange, but this time he would need more than spin to convince investors. The factory would have to double production to 100 cars a day. If this gamble worked, it would make DeLorean millions. The headlines in the local paper was, more jobs for DeLorean. Everybody was so excited. Instead of just the 2,000 that had been promised, John DeLorean was going to give us 2,700 jobs. This was great news. Can I turn to this sheet first, please? It's the Contracts for Employment Act 1965, the terms, conditions of employment. The subsidies were arranged in such a way that the more people you employed, the more money you got. And therefore, he was always trying to bolster uh, the business generally by employing more people. On behalf of the people of Northern Ireland, I'd like to thank oh, you for thank the employment you you've much. given. I think it's a magnificent effort and the best of luck. I didn't think he was ever to be trusted because I just looked at him and thought, well, I don't know. I just wonder what you're doing in Northern Ireland. Well, I've got a pint of blood for every pound that the British have in it, so I don't know. I think we're all about even there. We were bringing on new people at such a rate. And I'm talking about sometimes 200 a week. It's just impossible to do. Like, I remember standing with George Broomfield one day in the assembly. And this guy came over to us and he says, uh, excuse me, sir, could you tell me where the trim line is? And George says, well, you need to see the supervisor. And he says, excuse me, sir, I am the supervisor. This guy was the supervisor, had never seen where he was going to work before. John DeLorean wanted his 100 cars a day, and therefore that was what was planned for. Production was increased to 80 cars a day. By Christmas 1981, the workers had built 7,000 stainless steel DMC-12s. At the end of 81, we had a big party with all the management because we were celebrating the fact that these guys had done such a tremendous job, the company was profitable, everything was working well. Across the Atlantic, there were events even DeLorean couldn't control. In the US, disaster struck. Even in a country that expects severe winter weather, this storm has been something extraordinary. A city that was immobilized on the day of the snowfall is still immobilized four days later and could take a week to dig out. Several states in the northern part of America were declared disaster areas. Power lines were down, factories, including Ford and General Motor factories, were closing down. They couldn't get people into work. People most certainly were not going out in the blizzard to go to a car dealership. And the interest rate in the States had gone up to over 20%. It affected people changing their cars. So the sales of cars virtually stopped. I was in Northern Ireland for Christmas. I'd been to visit DeLorean, I think, about a month before. Everything seemed to be all right. Whilst I think I was at home, that I got a message saying that DeLorean hadn't got enough money to pay the wages. Senior staff had a Christmas dinner. Congratulations were all in order during the dinner. We were talking about bonuses for the next year, you know, so but obviously it was fellas from our minds that we were in trouble. And there was this man, DeLorean, strutting the stage a few, few weeks before, asking me for more money and saying how brilliant it all was and that cars were selling for a premium in the United States and everything else. I mean, it was one of the, the most glib PR operations I've ever come across. And that was the last time I saw him in the factory. No cars were selling, never mind DeLorean. So the income stopped overnight and the company ran out of money. That came as a surprise that the company failed for that reason. I had expected a lashback from quality problems, but I didn't think the weather would have stopped it. Of the 7,000 DMC-12s built, only 3,000 had been sold. With no sales and cash drying up, the company went on a three-day week. There are rumors going around the factory that there's anywhere from 250 to 500 men being made redundant. But nobody has denied it. 
or confirmed it. We have no idea of what the management are going to do about the situation, whether we'll have a job next week or the week after. And that's, uh, there's just a air of despondency throughout the factory. DeLorean now had to go cap in hand to the government to plead for more cash. So far, he had spent over 77 million pounds and now needed a further 40 million to weather the financial storm. We worked too long and too hard to let a few little aberrations bother us. It's important that we reestablish our public credibility and reestablish our relationship with the government on a positive basis. And what happens to Victoria if you, you don't get any money from the government now? I think you'll be very pleased with the news that you will hear tonight. I can't tell you any more about it right now. Will you be speaking later? Margaret Thatcher's Prime Minister um, was extremely worried on the one hand about the draining of public money into a very doubtful proposition and at the same time equally worried about uh, withdrawing support from something that in West Belfast was at least trying to get something moving in Belfast and Northern Ireland which would be of use in a peace process. Mr. Pryor, can I ask you, are you going to offer Mr. DeLorean any more money? No. None at all? Well, I think that uh, I, I must um, not answer that question in any other way than the way that I've answered it. What do you think the future of the car firm is? No, I'm, I'm not saying anything at the moment. I'm having discussions with Mr. DeLorean, and that's as far as I, I can go. We would have done anything we could to have kept the business running had it been a viable proposition. I mean, if he'd had money in the bank, etc., he wouldn't have need to come to me for an immediate bailout to pay the wages. On the 2nd of January 1982, with the coffers empty, 1,100 workers were laid off at the Dunmurray plant. I was being laid off. The factory wasn't being closed. And therefore, it was full of disappointment. It was grabbing you inside here. You were wondering, were you ever going to get back in? You were wondering, was it going to get sorted out? I remember I was a trustee of the pension fund at the time, and I remember signing so many checks, my fingers were sore. It was just sad, sad, sad to see it all happening, all unravelling, all the work that we'd put in, just unravelling before our eyes. Your stomach was just churning inside you, and it was a, it was a nasty, nasty day, but still with a degree of hope. With the company in financial meltdown, time was running out for John DeLorean. With one last roll of the dice, he used the New York car show to try and raise money to save his ailing company. I don't care about the British taxpayers' money or my own money. I think the most important thing is we have some people there. This is a very, very important part of their life, and nothing in the world should be permitted to interfere with it. No one could teach him any lessons on spin. I mean, he was very, very good. Other people have copied him. I'm sorry I'm doing this because I don't mean to sit here and, and be whiny. I, I'm not that kind of a person. But it just breaks my heart when I see these people attack him that way, and it's, not, it's just not fair. And I really think it's about time that somebody came to his defense. Unfortunately for the DeLoreans, the man riding to the rescue was the government receiver. Nicknamed The Undertaker, Sir Kenneth Cork was renowned for liquidating companies. DeLorean uh, was dead against any thought that his company was going into bankruptcy. And uh, therefore he, he desperately wanted to avoid that, but uh, I saw no alternative. We were all called into the office of the boardroom. And Sir Kenneth Cork, Paul Shule, addressed us at that time. Sir Kenneth was, was very supportive. He felt that, that there was a future for the company. And the one thing we want to do is to keep it going. And we're, I'm going to the States on Wednesday to see about the distribution out there. And um, we really do hope we can do something. We want it to go on. The race was on to find new investors by the 31st of May or the factory would close. DeLorean was desperate and would fly anywhere and try anything to raise more cash. Already today in the mail I got checks from Americans who want to help, one for $20 and another $10 bill. <laughs> I said, hang in there. A deal was on, then the deal was off. And eventually he ran out of banks and there was nobody that was going to help him there. All I want to do is keep the factory open so the people can work, but nothing else. You last said that you keep the factory open. It was your last breath. Do you still stand by that? I'm still trying. 
The next thing we heard, he was visiting the Middle East and he was speaking to oil sheiks ar around the Arab states and so on, trying to get them to buy into the company. And there were various ones that, were, that again, were, oh, this was going to happen, and then, no, it didn't happen. For the first time, DeLorean's charm failed, and his globe-trotting negotiations came to nothing. With no new investors in sight, the receiver was swift to act. He announced the closure of the factory. It was clear that there was no future. I, I mean, it stared one in the face. One just had to take the decision. On the 31st of May, 1982, the remaining 1,300 workers were laid off. The trade union actually told us in the end because nobody had the guts to come and face the workforce. The trade union told us, that's it, you're finished. I was managing one alliance at the time and um, I effectively had to go around every member of the, the workforce that was remaining and basically shake her hand and say thanks and we we tried you know when we got word that that's it the factory's gone the union called a meeting outside the front gate and there was a lot of resentment to the fact that we were all going to lose our jobs trade union officials were down and there was a lot of angry shouting going on and it was decided that the workers would take the factory over. We will fake jump prior, and we will fake bagging Thatcher as need be. I took part in the setting. I was the first one over the, the gate. I think it was 256 of us. Climbed the gate, stormed the gates, like the storm in the Bastille. And we took over the uh, canteen facilities. The factory was not destroyed in any way while we were here. To try and hold on to their jobs, the workers held out for 13 weeks. Belfast was still the unemployment black spot of Western Europe, and the men knew that if the factory closed, the prospect of them finding another job was virtually nil. But their best efforts were in vain. No buyer for the factory came forward, and the plant went into liquidation. I told Cork that he'd got to finish the thing off because I knew what was going to happen and Kenneth Cork didn't. The arrest of John DeLorean, he's charged with drug offences. Yes, I was tipped off, yes. Mr Pryor's officials say they didn't know, they're shocked and baffled. John DeLorean is due in court within the hour. The former head of the DeLorean car firm faces drug conspiracy charges. And if he's found guilty, he could go to prison for up to 15 years. I was very surprised that a person of that stature in the business world would involve himself in, in that kind of a uh, crime. There's a lot of individuals who commit crimes for the first time. There's always somebody who goes out and robs a bank. It's the first bank he robs. If you get presented with some information that somebody wants to deal in large amounts of drugs, you have to investigate, Gage. You can't ignore it. Early this morning, DeLorean's wife, model Christina Ferrara, flew in from New York to be with her husband, but had little to say to reporters. I just found out a few hours ago. I know nothing. I caught a plane. I'm here. I'm here to be with my husband. There's nothing I can say to you because I know nothing. DeLorean had been in secret negotiations with supposed bankers to raise the millions his company needed. While putting the deal together in a Los Angeles hotel room, he had been enticed by the prospect of making even more cash by trafficking cocaine. He had been dealing with undercover agents all along, and they had it all on tape. It was a classic FBI sting. If found guilty, he would go to jail for 15 years. It was one of those defining moments. I can also remember when Kennedy was killed. And I can remember September 11th, where I was and on those occasions. And I can also remember where I was when I seen the DeLorean thing on television. Between this and the other, it'll generate... Uh... Well, it'll generate about four and a half, five million. The other two were worldwide catastrophes. The DeLorean thing was a personal catastrophe. The other gold. <laughs> gold weighs more than that. I was stunned. I was just absolutely stunned. I just, I just couldn't believe it. And I think... 
about 2,000 other people were you know, the same. It was just an amazing piece of film. You don't want to presume guilt, but uh, my goodness, they did seem to have him red-handed, or white-handed, as the case may be. And I must admit, I was in bad shape at that time. I'd been struggling everywhere, trying to find money to keep my company alive. There was no crime committed. I never gave him any money. I never took any money. I had nothing to do with it. I was just a man who was a victim of uh, being stuck in the middle of this whole false scenario. Everybody looked at it, believed that they had a significant criminal problem, and that's why they moved on. And I have never heard anything to the contrary. I can tell you that, that anyone purposely set up John DeLorean. I do not believe that for one minute. He was expressing an interest in financing some type of operation that would produce quickly large sums of money on return from the investment. Knowing the nature of the man, I think he probably tried everything to keep the factory going, to keep the workers from work, keep the DeLorean car going. I thought that was his last resort. The DeLorean drug celebrity trial soon became a media frenzy. In the full glare of publicity, John DeLorean was forced to answer some harsh questions. During the first 53 years of your life, did you ever do anything dishonest, illegal, or immoral? Uh, yes. It was a defense idea to put him through the lie detector test. Even DeLorean couldn't spin his way out of this one, and soon revealed his ruthless streak. Or did you ever cheat someone or take advantage of anyone in a business deal? Yes, I would say. DeLorean's arrest was the final nail in the coffin for the Dunmurray plant, and the factory was wound up. Only a skeleton staff remained to put the last few cars together. About six cars uh, at different stages of build. So we were there right up until February uh, 83, building these last six cars. So literally, they were the, the last six cars that left the factory. And they were all built. Like, uh, like in a family business type, that they weren't built on an assembly line. People with the, the different skills would have formed a team and finished the car off. I didn't want the last one to go, because knowing that the last one was going meant that I wasn't going to get paid anymore. But whenever it did go, like it really did break our heart, you know. And I know that they were the best cars that, that left that factory. The plant machinery was auctioned off. And we were hanging labels on machines and what have you. And it was so sad because most of the equipment, you know, at some stage or other, had been involved in, in buying, installing. And it was sad just to see everything going. You said to yourself, like, well, what went wrong here? You know, why didn't this work? I had my own belief that he went too fast. Everything was too quick. Tried to produce too much. At the end of the day, we were trying to produce 400 cars a week. So we were 80, 80 a day, 40 in each shift. The market wasn't there for them. You know, you take a specialised sports car, producing 400 a week, that, that over 10 weeks is 4,000 cars. Uh, we have for sale this morning, perhaps the most controversial sports car in the world market today. I was earning at that time perhaps over a thousand pounds, taking up home over a thousand pounds a month. But when I, DeLorean closed, I went back on the dole. I went back with, on the dole with four kids at 47 pound a week. A historic moment for us all, ladies and gentlemen. The first DeLorean sports car to be sold, whether or made, in Northern Ireland. What am I bid? The sad legacy of DeLorean was not only a loss of jobs, but one of the sad legacy was the fact that a lot of people built on the expectations they had were left up there next, perhaps, in uh, repayments and debt. £10,000 for the first car. We all thought we had a job for life. That was the saddest part about it. £12,000 right in front of me. 
Are we all finished at 12,000 pounds for the first car? We are participating in history. Yeah, the troubles were ongoing. There was little or no job opportunities that were uh, on the horizon. So, Dorian created a, a sense of purpose and a sense of hope uh, for a lot of people within a lot of communities. Those people knew what they were going back into. All finished at 15-1. The last DeLorean sports car on sale. On the 16th of August 1984, a Los Angeles jury found John Zachary DeLorean not guilty of all eight drug charges. They ruled out as inadmissible the apparently damning evidence of the videotapes, believing instead that DeLorean had been set up by the FBI. Was he in trap? Uh, you know, I'm sure the, uh, the FBI agents who worked the case, the ones out in the field, the United States Attorney's Office, would say no. People get off on entrapment, uh, few get off, the great, great majority don't. I mean, we've had celebrity trials in, in places like Los Angeles and so forth that there's no question about it. It's, uh, it, it's a difficult case for the prosecution to win. And I'm not saying that happened here, but at the same time, it's, uh, it might have been a factor. Mr. DeLorean got off, he got off. For the next few years, DeLorean's life became one trial after another. Back in the UK, former chairman of Lotus, Fred Bushell, was left to carry the can in a fraud case involving the siphoning off of over eight and a half million pounds of DeLorean Motor Company cash to a Swiss bank account. He was jailed for three years. His boss at Lotus, Colin Chapman, had taken his involvement to the grave. The judge remarked that had John DeLorean been in the UK, he could have expected a 10-year sentence. He was a hero to us all right up to near the end. Well, he was the guy who brought a dream, and we all lived that dream. We all felt part of that dream, and it was our dream. But when you found out what had really went on, you had to say to yourself, you know, a lot of the blame must lie with John DeLorean. Uh, life uh, as a hard-working industrialist has been tattered and torn. I, I don't know, would you buy a used car from me? <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to meet anyone who worked for DeLorean who did not enjoy their time there and look back upon it as one well, of the happiest days of their lives. Oh well, actually, I found it quite attractive. And I think the first few that came off the production line sold for a premium for the first few days. There was a sense of bitter, bitter disappointment. But that was tempered with an enormous amount of pride. They had done something that nobody else had ever done. They'd done something that Ford said couldn't be done, that Mercedes said couldn't be done, that Porsche said couldn't be done, and they did it. I hear from John time to time. He phones up usually with some new interesting project that he's got and wondering whether I'd love to go over to Long Island and, uh, and run the project for him. Would I be attracted to that? <laughs> it's very different. Never say never, they say. Something inherent about this thing that just says future. I mean, even I, I feel it even does today. I mean, this does not look like it's dated. You know, it's still, uh, if you saw one out on the road today, you'd still say, holy, look at that, you know? Anyway, it's such a shame that um, it didn't work out, this car, because it would have been good for everybody. 